and movement. And then here in the foreground on the left-hand side is the main subject, is Brutus, clouded in shadow, contemplating what he's done. A man who's made the ultimate sacrifice of his sons for his state. It's very easy with hindsight to see this work as a statement of revolutionary intent by David. But we need to remind ourselves that in fact he didn't know that the king was going to be deposed and eventually killed. And in fact, what was required by the revolution at this time was a constitutional monarchy. However, in that volatile political climate of 1789, David must have known what he was doing in showing this work. And the king's agents tried to have the work taken down off the salon walls. But such was its critical, and perhaps more crucially, its popular success, that the work remained and was declared a triumph. As the revolution progressed, David became increasingly politicised. Recent events made him aware that he was living through a period of momentous change. In 1791, he began work on a monumental painting commemorating the founding moment of the revolution, the oath sworn by members of the self-proclaimed National Assembly in the tennis court of Versailles. Seen here in a highly finished ink drawing, the oath of the tennis court was David's first attempt at depicting a contemporary event. Part documentary record, part propaganda, he approached the subject just as he would have done a story from the ancient world. But only a year after beginning the work, many of the principal protagonists had been discredited and were later executed. So to continue would have been dangerous, and therefore David's grand revolutionary painting was never finished. In September 1792, David's involvement with politics reached new heights when he was elected a deputy of the Convention, the newly established revolutionary government. And he allied himself with the most radical faction within the Convention, the Mountain Group, and in particular to its leader, the former lawyer Maximilien Robespierre, who became one of the most powerful politicians of revolutionary France. A year later, and the Convention voted narrowly for the execution of the king by guillotine, with David one of the most vociferous supporters of the idea. But his wife was horrified, and in fact, she filed for divorce. But on the 16th of January, 1793, Louis XVI was indeed executed on what was called La Place de la Révolution, now the Place de la Concorde. But ironically, it wasn't the brutal execution of the king that inspired David's greatest and most celebrated painting. That came from the savage murder of a revolutionary. David's increasing involvement with radical Parisian politics led to him producing probably the greatest image of the French Revolution. This one, sometimes called the death of Marat, but called by David Marat breathing his last, which is significant because it shows a man who's just about to die. Now, it tells a brilliant story. The story of Marat, the doctor who became a radical journalist, who edited a magazine called Friend of the People, but who also proclaimed that in order for the revolution to succeed, it must become more violent. And in turn, this triggered a young woman from Normandy, from the town of Caen, called Charlotte Corday, to come to Paris on the eve of the revolution's anniversary, on the 13th of July, 1793, in order to assassinate Marat. And she gets access into his apartment by sending him a note saying there's counter-revolutionary activity going on in Normandy. And when she gets in, he's in the bath because he has this chronic skin com complaint. And she pulls a butcher's knife out from under her dress, plunges it into Marat's heart, drops the knife, and then waits to be arrested and then executed. And what David proclaims in this painting is that Marat is the first great martyr of the French Revolution. And all the details point to that. The sheets on which he lies and on which his blood seeps are patched to show his modesty. He clutches a blood-splattered note written by Corday, proclaiming her own wretchedness and playing on his good nature because she needs his kindness. The quill that he holds, slumped down by the side of the bath, he's just used to write a note authorising money to a woman and her five children whose father has just been killed fighting the revolutionary cause. And then this packing case, his modest desk, becomes a tombstone and a homage Amara, to Mara from David, with the date, the old Roman date, 1793, rubbed out and replaced with Londres, the second year of the revolution. But there's a bigger picture to grasp here. First of all, look at the background. No extraneous detail. This dark, murky void that pushes the figure out, makes it stand out, and makes it almost supernatural in the way that it's illuminated. And the pose, with life seeming to empty out of it, slumped over the bath, is also reminiscent of numerous paintings of Christ being taken down from the cross 
or the Pietà, where he's held by his mother, or perhaps best of all, the entombment. And it's as if the bath itself becomes his tomb. What you also need to remember is when David saw the body, it was putrefying, it was decomposing. It was also covered in rashes and sores from Mara's chronic skin complaint. But here, all that seems to have been transformed, and the body seems in a way to be made out of marble. So what David is doing here, in a very acute, clever, political and propagandist gesture, is to produce an image partly of a classical god, partly of a religious martyr, in what is in effect a republican altarpiece. With the execution of the king, France was plunged into a period of violent repression known as the Reign of Terror, in which almost 40,000 people died. During this time, David served a term as president of the convention, and so will forever be implicated in this dark period of French history. But by July 1794, the tide had turned. Robespierre and his supporters were overthrown and were guillotined just days later. David himself was imprisoned and came very close to being executed. Whilst in prison, David painted this open and sympathetic self-portrait, which seems to invite the viewer to judge him not as a politician, but as a painter. During this crisis in his life, David's wife, Charlotte, returned to support her embattled husband, and the two were remarried two years later. At a time of great insecurity for David, portraiture provided an uncontroversial means of continuing his work. In 1795, he painted this skillfully executed image of the Dutch ambassador, Jacobus Blau, proving that his ordeal had not decreased his immense talent for painting. And it was through a portrait commission that David was to meet a man who would change not just his life, but also who would alter the course of European history. Napoleon Bonaparte was a young Corsican soldier who'd worked his way up to become general in the Revolutionary Army and had just returned to Paris after a very successful campaign in Italy. And such was his status as hero that he was able to seek out the most famous French portrait painter of the day and ask him to paint his likeness. And this is the result. Now, it's unfinished. And one of the reasons was, as David later commented, that Napoleon was so restless and full of energy, he only sat for three hours. It's a fascinating painting, this one, because it reveals very simply and obviously something of the process of making a painting, from the simple lines that create the pose to the build-up of layers of paint. And that magical idea of transformation, of inert pigment on canvas into something approaching the likeness of a living, breathing human being. It also has this slightly magical aura because it shows Napoleon as a young man and hints at the idea of him becoming something else, something grander. And in fact, within two years of David doing this portrait, he'd staged a coup d'etat with the help of the army and proclaimed himself first consul of France. And within a few more years, with various military victories behind him, he'd become, in effect, a military dictator. And with that...